I'm going to go a little further into what is being described here as the judgment seat of Christ. Um, we learned last week concerning uh, this passage of Scripture. We, we, we actually took what it said in verse 10 about take heed. Uh, and so it was a warning about this time coming in which our works are going to be tried. And there's going to be reward or loss of reward. So now let's read the passage. And then uh, I'll remind you a few things that we said last week. And then talk about today's subject will be uh, the materials that you're to build with. And uh, the, it's part of the description in the passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10. It says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built it thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we do thank you for your love and for your grace. We thank you for the salvation that's free in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that sin will never be held against us or us judged for our sins, because he on that cross took our judgment and paid for our sins. But Father, may we take seriously the life that you've given us and the service we've been called unto and realize that there is going to be this judgment seat of Christ and our works will someday be tried and we'll either receive a reward or a loss of reward based on what we have done. So we pray that we'll take heed as the passage says and learn more about uh, what faces us when we stand before your son to give an account of our service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now that, as we said in verse 10 there, when Paul says, Take heed how other man buildeth thereupon. Paul said he laid a foundation. That's really important to see. Uh, he also says that he's the wise master builder. So if we're to take heed how we build thereupon, how is it that we're to build upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ laid by the Apostle Paul? Well, the, the obvious answer we said last week is according to the master plans. If he's the wise master builder, that means he's been given by God the instructions about what God is building. So we would learn from the Apostle Paul how to build on what he laid, the foundation of Jesus Christ. Now Jesus Christ is the foundation for everything that God is ever going to accomplish in this world. He's the foundation of what God, how God's going to build a kingdom out of the nation of Israel and be glorified in the earth. But he's also the foundation upon which God is building today the body of Christ through which the, 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 uh, uh, Jesus Christ will be glorified in the heavens. In fact... What we are as members of the body of Christ, we are the, the instrument that God is going to use as trophies of his grace in heavenly places, as a display to the angels in heaven about the grace of God, so that we're not part of what God was doing with Israel, we're a part of something else that began with the Apostle Paul, it's based on Jesus Christ, but the warning is how to build thereupon. We call ourselves, by the way, if you're new to Grace Bible Church, we are a mid-Acts Pauline dispensational Bible church. And that's a way of describing the fact that we believe that what God is doing today is called the dispensation of the grace of God. It began with the Apostle Paul, and what God is doing in, today is building the body of Christ, and that is through the, the, the ministry of grace revealed to the Apostle Paul. It'll end at the rapture when we're caught up into heaven. God's calling for us as the heavenly places. And then God will continue his program with Israel. He's going to pour out his wrath on this earth, save the believers, remnant of Israel and establish a kingdom on this earth that Jesus Christ is going to reign on forever and ever. You'll see some of the contrast to that in just a little bit. The whole point is, is if we're going to stand and give account of our service, you better know what God's doing today. 
So that's why we talked about be, taking heed, how we build thereupon, and therefore the way to build thereupon is according to the plans given to the Apostle Paul, the instructions of what God is, is accomplishing today as revealed to the Apostle Paul. In fact, the, the, for later on, the, the wording that we're going to read in just a minute uh, should ring a bell later on. So come, hold your place here. Come with me to 1 Timothy. It, it just establishes just what we just said. 1 Timothy chapter 1. The Apostle Paul came on the scene after Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, after the Holy Spirit was poured out, after the twelve apostles went and preached to Israel, and they continued to reject Jesus Christ even after his resurrection and ascension. After the Holy Spirit empowered the twelve apostles with signs and wonders, Israel, they're stiff-necked and, and continued to reject uh, the, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and that became, became the end where wrath was to be poured out on this earth, but instead, Saul of Tarsus, who was the ringleader of those rejecting Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ revealed himself to, to Paul, Saul of Tarsus, from heaven, and made him Paul the apostle to the Gentiles, and sent him out to the Gentiles with a message of grace. A whole different revelation of truth that was given to the Apostle Paul about what God is doing today. So, as, as, you, as you read 1 Timothy chapter uh, 1, verse 3, it says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Paul trained Timothy to continue his ministry. Paul's facing death here. And, and people at Ephesus, a church that Paul established, are starting to teach other things. They're, they're, te they're teaching fables, they're teaching genealogies, they're going back to Israel's law. And Paul's instructing Timothy that, that you tell those teachers at Ephesus that they teach no other doctrine. No other doctrine other than the doctrine given to the Apostle Paul, which in verse 11 he says, according to the glory... Well, verse, the end of verse 13 says, uh, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. And we talked about that soundness. If you're building something, you want to build something sound. Paul's doctrine is sound for today. But he says, according to sound doctrine, uh, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Now the God, the Holy Spirit, inspiring these words are telling you who are reading this passage right here that this is something you can count on, it's faithful, and you need to accept this. What? that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He was the ringleader of those persecuting Christ. But Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Boy, there's some time limits in there, isn't there? That when, God, when Jesus Christ saved Saul of Tarsus and made him Paul the Apostle of the Gentiles and revealed grace to him to, to preach that message out to the Gentiles, that Paul became the first of the long-suffering of God and a pattern of all who believe hereafter. So something began with the Apostle Paul. That's why over there in Corinthians, he's saying he laid the foundation. And it's the pattern... He's got the instructions on how we're to build. So go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Hopefully those words will ring in your mind in just a, in a moment. But he gives that warning of how to build and then warns that there is an eternal consequence of how you build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. We said, by the way, verses 12 through 15 is a warning to the builders. And, and everybody who's saved, once you're saved, you're saved to serve. But verses 16 and through the end of the chapter there is a warning to the defilers. That's two different groups of people, but we'll point that out when we get down to verse 16. So 
to the believer who is, who's been saved and now is going to build upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ, needs to build sound doctrine, needs to know what God is doing today so that he's doing, he's building what God wants him to build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. And, and then what he builds is going to be rewarded as an eternal reward or an eternal loss of rewards. Now, I say that because uh, Gary Schiller come to me after the service and he said, did you say that right? Because I ended by saying that the rewards you get, they're going to be eternal. You can't get a reward after. The reward is for service in this life, and you're going to receive a reward, and that reward is going to be an eternal reward. But if you suffer loss, you're going to suffer loss for all eternity. Now that sounds like, ooh, like you're lost. No, no. You're going to suffer the loss of a reward. You can't get it later. You will never be able to regain or get that reward. So the loss of the work that you've done that's going to be burned up, it's going to be burned up forever. No other chance. So you understand what I'm saying there. It's not that you're going to be lost. In fact, it talks about the man's going to be, even if he suffers loss, he's going to be saved yet so as by fire. The person's still saved, just the opportunity of being rewarded is lost forever. So what, 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 what you, when you die and you stand at the judgment seat of Christ, your reward is eternal or your loss of reward is eternal. So it's real important to first get saved, be built up with sound doctrine, and then serve according to that sound doctrine because if you build contrary to that sound doctrine, that's a loss that's going to be forever. Now, if you'll begin, we're going to continue now in verse 12. It's a, it says, now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now as we talk about this, we call this the judgment seat of Christ. You'll see the verse later on that there's going to be a time that we're all going to give an account of our service. Notice our works are being judged at this point. Your sins are not being judged at this point. Your sins were judged at the cross of Calvary. Jesus Christ didn't leave one sin unpaid for, that God the Father is, is not satisfied that Jesus Christ left something out, or he is satisfied that he paid it all. Get lost on which way I'm saying that. But I want you to understand, it's not sin that you're going to stand before Jesus Christ and give an account of. We're talking about building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. We're talking about our service and a reward. Eternal life is a gift. But here your service is going to be rewarded. Remember over there in verse, uh, uh, verse 8, when he talked about him and Apollos? It says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. God is going to reward faithful service. And, and so there's going to, your service is going to be rewarded. We're not talking about your sins. That's real important to understand. But, but at this judgment seat of Christ, there's an illustration here that your works are going to fall in, into these categories that are called gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. But verse 13, every man's work is going to be manifest. I mean, your, what you, your work of service is going to become clear what it is. Now sometimes it's not clear. I'll explain why, why that's true. But it says, for the day shall declare it. There's coming a day. We'll talk about that day next week. It says, because it shall be revealed by fire. So it's going to be made manifest because it's going, the fire is going to reveal what sort of work it is. Because if any man's work abide, if it abides the fire, it's going to be rewarded. If any man's work shall be burned, he's going to suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. You're going to, the loss of service is going to be burned away, yet you have eternal life as a gift from God. God is faithful, and he will give you eternal life. You're already in heaven when this takes place. So you get the idea how this fire is going to make manifest what kind of work each man has. So as we think about these materials, they, they, they must be... They must tell us something about this judgment seat of Christ and what's going to be expected out of us in the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the truth of the matter is, all you've got to do is read all of Paul's epistles, and especially the practical portion, like we were studying Romans chapter 12 in our adult Sunday school class. Very practical of illustration of, of how you're to minister according to the effectual measure of, of God's word in you. 
and then how you're to do it out of love, and then how you do it to the saints, how you do it to the world, and that's just chapter 12. That's what you're going to be judged on. That, that's your service. So you could actually study everything Paul wrote about your practical Christian life and realize that those are the things God's going to be concerned with, but that's a big list. There's a way that Paul's got it all narrowed down here in this illustration of six building materials. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. That's interesting. Six is the number of man, and there's six materials that he's talking about here, and how each man is going to give an account of what sort of his work is out of those six categories. Now, in those six categories, they illustrate the importance to God. Because what abides the fire is important to God. What gets burned up wasn't important to God. So these six pieces of material indicate or illustrate what is important to God. Notice that they are progressive, progressively diminished in value. Gold, that's the highest value. Right behind gold is silver. Right behind silver, precious stones. Notice it doesn't say stones. <laughs> Precious stones, not, a, not just a piece of rock out in the ground there, but we're talking about jewels in that kind of category. So there's gold, and then, under, and then behind that is silver, behind that is precious stones, behind that is wood. Wood is very useful. Then there's hay. Well, that's not quite as useful, certainly not as valuable as a piece of wood is. And then stubble. That's like the scrap out of... Out of uh, 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 of the corn stock when you're all done with the corn. It's just stubble. So you realize you're going from gold all the way to stubble, and there's this diminishing as you go. So there's a diminishing value, and you look at that as it's listed there. Then notice that they're actually divided into two categories. Gold, silver, precious stones. All that's very, very valuable. Wood, hay, and stubble is pretty common. So they're, they're broken down into two categories when you look a little bit closer at it. And those two categories are really what's described in the illustration of what abides the fire and what the fire is going to burn up. So it becomes real clear, this picture here that, that the Apostle Paul is drawing for us. These two categories match this statement. Hold your place here, come to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8 says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Paul is willing to die to get the gospel out. And, and he's willing to be absent from the body, that is to die, and your soul and spirit leave the body. And for a saved person, it goes to a place of destiny. It goes to be with the Lord. Resurrection is always your body going to be raised from the dead. Between death and resurrection, your, your soul and your spirit leave your body, and for the believer, it goes home to be with the Lord. That's why Thessalonians talks about comfort one another with these words. But anyhow, it says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather, to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Paul knows there's a judgment to stand and his service, he wants his service to be something that's acceptable to God. Verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Two categories, good and bad. Now we're not talking about, when you say good and bad, bad doesn't mean sin. Good means the thing that is acceptable with God. Wood, uh, gold, silver, precious stone. What's bad is burned away. Wood, hay, and stubble. That wasn't acceptable with God. So you've got to be careful how you build thereon. There's those two categories. They're called good and bad. Bad in your Bible, just, just in the sense, for instance, if you just live a good life for yourself, is that good or bad? That's bad. Is it sinful? No. It's just you live for yourself and not for the Lord. You know, the next verse, I was telling him in Sunday school, that verse 11, see, Paul 
through three chapters here, has been talking about, uh, even more, he's been talking about his ministry. Th this chapter is a real important chapter. When he says in verse 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. I believe when he's talking about knowing the terror of the Lord, that Paul's talking about his ministry to lost people, why he shares the gospel. Because we're talking about our service. Now let me ask you, is witnessing something good? If you never witnessed anyone, is that bad? Yes. Is it sin? No. <laughs> it's just you didn't do something good. And, and so when you talk about your, that you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Paul's talking about his service being accepted by God. So that he's got, a, he's got a ministry to save people, he's got a ministry to lost people, and he's exercising his ministry the way that God would have him build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. If you get saved and never serve the Lord, is that good or bad? It's bad. You were saved to serve. And, and so there's these, these, these areas here that we talk about when they're going to fall in those two categories, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. And the fire is going to manifest it. You put fire to gold, silver, precious stone, it's still gold, silver, precious stone. You put fire to wood, hay, and stubble, it's no longer either one of the, none of those things. It's not wood, it's not hay, or it's not stubble, it's charcoal. <laughs> it's gone. It, it, it burned away. You suffer loss. What, what are you losing? All the work you've ever done in this life. The things done that you are in this body and the things you've done in this body, it's going to be, if it's wood, hay, and stubble, it's going to be burned away and you're going to stand before Jesus Christ and he says, oh, you've done nothing. Thanks for trusting my son as my savior. As, well, God the Father would say, thank you for trusting my son. The Lord Jesus Christ said, you did trust in me and I'm faithful. Here's everlasting life. Enter into salvation. Will you be happy that you're going to heaven or in heaven? A lot of people talk about, I'd be happy just being a street sweeper in the streets of gold there, you know. Because you're in heaven. There, there's nothing, but, but the chance of honoring the Lord and being rewarded is over. Because it's this, this life that you have to do that. So those two categories, are those six uh, materials are broken down into two categories. And we can just call them good or bad. Now the three... The first three, gold, silver, precious stone, are associated... Uh, go, make sure I, you're back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 to make sure you see this. When you think about this, gold, silver, precious stones are associated with the Old Testament building materials for a temple. Look at chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? God does not dwell in buildings made with hands, the Apostle Paul tells us. With the coming of the Holy Spirit and God saving the Gentiles, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells you as a believer. Seals you unto the day of redemption. You're going to heaven. He makes sure you're going to be there. You can grieve the Holy Spirit in your life. That's not good. That's bad. That'll be burned away. Or you can walk after the Spirit. And, and, and live pleasing to God that way, that's good. And that'll be rewarded. But my point is, is those materials, when you think about that, and then Paul makes that statement that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, that immediately goes back to those mat building materials and realize those building materials is what Israel, when they wanted to honor God and make Him a house to dwell in, that they built it out of gold, silver, and precious stone. There is some wood in the temple. But even that wood is all covered with gold. Well, let me show you something. Go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. This is the end of David's life. His son Solomon is going to pick up reigning over Israel. After he departs, he declares it here, and lucky he did because another brother tried to take over the throne when David died, and that had to be put down. Solomon is the one that God has chosen. David so declares it right here. But First, first Chronicles chapter 29, verse 1 says, Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon my son, 
whom alone God has chosen, is yet a young, uh, young and tender, and the work is great. For the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. You talk about saying something that has double implication. Not only does it mean that God is, is involved in who reigns over Israel, but who really will sit in that palace and reign over Israel? The Lord God. His name is Jesus Christ. And so David says, the palace is for the Lord God. So verse 2 he says, Now I have prepared with all my might uh, for the house of my God the gold for the things to be made of gold and the silver for the things of silver and brass for the things of brass and iron for the things of iron and wood for the things that are wood uh, onyx stones and stones to be set in, in glistering stones and, and, uh, and of diverse colors and of all manner of precious stones and marble stones in abundance. So David, as he was not allowed to build the temple, he started preparing for Solomon to build that temple. As you go on, moreover, because I have set my affection uh, to the house of my God, I have of my own uh, 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 proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God. He, David not only has been storing up gold and silver and all these materials to build the temple, out of his own treasury, he has donated it to the, the, the building, the future building of that temple. Now, something else about that. So he's, he's going to help Solomon build that temple by preparing some things. Look over in chapter 28 of this chapter. And in verse 10, it says, Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build a house for, my, for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Isn't that interesting? What did Paul tell us? Take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So David is telling Solomon in this chapter, now take heed how you build thereupon. What does he mean by that? Verse 11, Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and of the house thereof and of the treasury thereof and of the upper chambers thereof and of the inner parlors thereof and of the uh, place of the mercy seat and the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit of God of the court of the house of the Lord, and of all the chambers round about, of the treasuries of the house of God, and the treasuries of the dedicated things. Look over in, in uh, verse 19. It says, And all this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me even all the work of this pattern. David was given a pattern of how that temple was to be built. All the different rooms of the temple, all the materials of the temple. And he's telling Solomon, take heed how you build thereupon, right? Make sure that you do it by what God revealed to me, by my writing of God's hand, of how this is to be built. He had the pattern of the temple for the nation of Israel, and Solomon is going to build that. And David laid it all out by inspiration of God. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that exactly what Paul is saying? As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Paul is a pattern to all them that believe hereafter. He's the first of what God's doing in this age of grace, and he says, he's the wise master builder, take heed how you build thereupon. But we're not talking about building a structure of a building. We're talking about our bodies being the temple of the Holy Ghost. And where they use gold, silver, and precious stone, even wood, not too much hay and stubble in here, but even wood to build this temple, we are to, use, we are to realize that's an illustration of what's important to God for us today in a spiritual sense. And because we're the temple of the Holy Ghost that God is building, and it's going to be revealed by fire of what sort it is, the materials that we have built thereupon. Now go with me to 1 Kings um, chapter 6. Now you might not understand this, but 1 Kings is actually now moving ahead of David into Solomon's reign. It just depends how familiar you are with 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings. But 1 Kings, now we're going into Solomon's reign and his building of the temple. I just want to point something out to you. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, says, It came to pass in the 480th year, 
after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month of Ziph, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. Boy, there's a, you ever chart out Bible time? Here's a, you can go all the way back to Israel coming out of Egypt and find out how many years it's been since, until Solomon's fourth year when he begins to reign. You can even find out what month it is. So he gives that timing, but my point is that Solomon is now going to start building that temple that he's instructed to build. I just want you to see verse 21 and 22. It says, so Solomon, verse 21, so Solomon overlaid the house within with pure gold, and he made a pattern by the, the chains of gold before the oracles, and he overlaid it with gold. And the whole house he overlaid with gold until he had finished all the house. Also the whole altar that, he was, uh, that was by the oracles he overlaid with gold. Do you think gold was something that was precious in God's sight? <laughs> even, even the things that were made out of wood... Solomon covered it with gold because what was important, they're building a house of God and there's gold, silver, and precious stones is, is the way that they would display the glory of God. We want to have built into our life, since we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the things that glorify God, which would be like the gold, silver, and precious stone, but something different about that. Because we're not talking about actual gold, silver, and precious stone. That, that's just an illustration. But it's an illustration of what Solomon did and how gold was important in this, in this illustration. Now, gold in your Bible... Oh, by, uh, Do you remember when Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the temple and he burned it down? Those pillars of brass that were there, he actually cut them in pieces and drug them all the way back to Babylon. I would have been the guy that was responsible to do that. A lot of work. But he burned the temple down. When he burned that temple down, what do you think was left when he burned the temple? Gold, silver, and precious stones. He burned that temple down and surely he then went and went through those ashes and look at this pile of melted gold. Here's a pile of silver. Here, look at all these stones, these precious stones. And he took those and went to Babylon. So the, it was tried with fire back then too. But what I was going to say to you is when you think about those things, gold, silver, and precious stones, gold in your Bible always represents God. Sometimes it represents a king. Like when the Lord Jesus Christ was born, they brought unto him gold, representing knowing that he was a king. But when Israel was going to make an artificial god, remember they made a cow? Did they make it out of wood, hay, and stubble? <laughs> no, they made it out of gold. In fact, the Bible constantly warns about the idols of gold, gods of gold. Because someone who, who wants to uh, make a substitute God and really want to make it glorious, they make it out of gold. Gold in your Bible represents God. Uh, silver in your Bible is, is, is actually the money that's used for redemption. Let, let me show you that. Le, Leviticus, go back again in the Old Testament. Leviticus uh, chapter 5. Leviticus chapter 5, just verse 15 will we'll kind of identify it with you. And you'll see how it's related to being redeemed. Leviticus 5 verse 15 says, If a soul commit a trespass and sin through ignorance in the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring, he shall bring for his trespass unto the Lord a ram without blemish of the, of the flock with the estima, estimation by the shekel of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary for a trespass offering. A shekel of silver. So a shekel is the redemption money. This man needs to be redeemed from a trespass that he did, and he needs to bring that estimate about that the priest had estimated and bring that in, and it's a shekel of silver. In fact, the book of Numbers calls it when Israel divided up and did a, a numbering of the people and then paid off the difference between the firstborn in Egypt and the, and the Le Levites. They had to pay the, the money of redemption. They had, the difference had to be bought off by God and had to be bought off by shekels. 
and it's called redemption money. So that when you talk about silver, silver it represents redemption. Now, by the way, if gold represents God, we would be speaking about God the Father, would we not? Who is the Redeemer but the Lord Jesus Christ? I hope you already know that. That he redeemed us with his blood by dying on the cross and paying for our sins. And, and so when we talk about silver, it represents God the Son. So if you think that, then it's not really hard to see the illustration that the precious stones would represent the Holy Spirit in our life. In, 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 this, uh, in this way, come over to Exodus chapter 28. In verse 15, this is going to be the, the clothing of the high priest. It says, And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with the cunning work after the work of the ephod, and make it of gold, of blue, of purple, scarlet, fine twine linen, shall thou make it. If you get down, there's settings in there for stones in verse 17, and thou shalt set in the settings of stones even four rows of stones. First row shall be the sardis, the topaz, the carbuncle. That's the first row. The second row in verse 18 there is going to be the emerald, the sapphire, the diamond. The third row is going to be the luger, the agate, and the anathem. <laughs> Anthosum, whatever that is. <laughs> the fourth row, the burly, the onyx, the jasper. These are the breastplate that the, the priest is going to wear is going to have, those are all precious stones and it, they represent the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 stones. Look over at verse 29. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth into the holy place for memorial unto the Lord continually. You know where the Holy Spirit dwells today in us? He dwells in our heart. He wants to guide our heart to the things that God would want. Gold, silver, precious stone have to do with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit work in our life. Wood, hay, and stubble, well, we'll talk about that in a moment. But if you just kind of build a little bit upon that, gold, silver, and precious stone. Gold then would be our worship are recognizing who God is for our service of God, because this is all about service. If we related it back to that verse in Timothy, that your, your body is the house of God, or the church is the house of God, the house of the living God, the next verse says, great is the mystery of godliness. You know what's going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ? Gold is godliness. How much you reverenced God, how much you served God, how much godliness was produced in your life. The re reason I said it's going to be tried with fire is you can look godly and you can fool me. But is it really the work of God in your life or is it you just trying to look the best you can look as a Christian? Well, the fire will try it and make manifest and it's going to be revealed by fire. Whether it's really the work of God in your life and it was really godliness there and not just artificial self-righteousness. So silver then would have to do with, with Jesus Christ living in us. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Does he live in you? Paul said in Philippians, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Can you say that? Because at the judgment seat of Christ, Christ's life in you is going to be manifest, whether it's been you or whether it's been Christ. And if it's been Christ, it's going to be rewarded. Precious stones. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost that He has given to us. He told us to be filled with the Spirit, to walk after the Spirit, to be under the control of the Spirit, to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly, that God is working in us to will and to do of His good pleasure. Well, who's in us? It's God the Holy Spirit that's in us. And, and as a result of that, there's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, patience. Temperance, I should say. There is what Titus says, adorning the doctrine of God. All of those facts are going to be revealed at the judgment seat of Christ. Whether God has been working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure, or whether you've been working on your own, doing your own thing all of your life. It's going to be manifest and it's going to be rewarded. 
Now with that illustration of gold, silver, precious stone being God working in our life, it certainly would represent spiritual life. Gold, silver, and precious stone were to walk after, were to be spirit-filled. We're talking about a spiritual life. The opposite of a spiritual life is what we learned already in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians of being carnal, living like lost people, living for the flesh. So when you then think if gold, silver, and precious stone represents spiritual life, what does wood, hay, and stubble represent? Well, wood, hay, and stubble represent the carnal life, living fleshly life. Those are the things that are going to be burned. These things don't value, have no value to God. So they're wood, hay. Wood is common. That, that is a good building material. It's good for warming the body. It's good for cooking food. It's good for you. Hay. Well, that's good for animals, isn't it? But why is it good for animals? Well, you feed the animals so you can feed your belly, the flesh. So you, get, you can cook, and you can stay warm, and you feed the animals so you can feed your belly. Stubble. You know, when you read about stubble in the Bible, it's always either something, it's actually fuel for the fire. <laughs> you want to get a good fire, go and throw a bunch of stubble in there. It'll just burn up real quick. But if it's not burned up, the wind will just blow it away. It'll be gone. It, you know what it is? Stubble is worthless, even to us. So gold, uh, wood, hay, and stubble just represents the flesh that is all going to be burned away. So that the purpose of the fire is to make known of what sort is our work out of those six categories. Is it the things of the Lord or is it things of self? Now look at with me in close. 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Like I say, that we're talking about God working in us. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Every one of them have a part in your life. God's Word, God's Son. Even when we talk about redemption there, and we think about the Lord Jesus Christ living in us. Well, he did, when Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, I persuade men. Do you think evangelism is going to be important at the judgment seat of Christ? That you learn that Jesus Christ redeemed you, paid for all of your sins. That's good. You're going to have eternal life. But never tell that to someone else. Your work, when Paul told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Work is going to be rewarded. You can see what silver would represent, even, even that area of evangelism. But you can expand all of these things, just reading all the things that God said that he wants to accomplish in your life. And if you read God's word and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly and walk after the spirit, that's going to become manifest and rewarded for all eternity. But, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says in verse 13, meets for the belly, and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Your belly's going to be gone, and all the food you ever ate is going to be gone. That has no value. Now, the body is not for fornication. Sometimes people think that's all they live for. What's your body for? But for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his own power. Know ye not that your body is the, is the uh, that your body, your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. So your body isn't just for eating and sensual pleasure. It belongs to the Lord. Which way did you use it? Look down in verse 19. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, notice this, and ye are not your own. Therefore, uh, for ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So your body and your spirit belong to God. You're dwelt by the Holy Spirit, and you're not your own. You're bought with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ. You belong to him. Just getting in your mind, you are not your own. Do you live for self? That's not why God saved you. You belong to him. Now glorify him in your body and in your soul because it belongs to God. You only have this life to serve God in the body that you have. Come over with me to, to uh, 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, where again, we just read that verse 10, we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, but look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 14. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. They were all, every man, God looked at the whole world, saw every man dead in sin. But Jesus Christ died for every man. Verse 15, And that he died for all, that they which live, that's the people who trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. So, someday what you've done in this body, who you served, whether it's self or God, is going to become manifest. What you've done in the body, whether, whether you have taken the grace of God and allowed the grace of God to transform your life that you might serve and glorify God in this body is going to become manifest. And you're going to be rewarded. The fire is going to try it, and you're going to be rewarded of what sort your works are. Gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. And you're going to receive an eternal reward based on that. Now, the other questions that we need to ask is, when is that day? <laughs> what are the rewards exactly? What does it mean to suffer loss and to be yet saved, yet so as by fire? So we'll continue next week as we go back and, and look at these things. But I think the important thing is that take heed and then understanding something about those materials and, and what God is doing in our life, in our bodies that we have today and for what reason. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for the gathering of each person here. We realize how important it is. It's good to come to church on Sunday. It's bad to stay home unless there was a reason that we couldn't be here. So, Father, using our bodies today to come and to be edified, using our eyes, our minds, and then even our hearts to take in the truth of your word is precious and important as we study this passage of Scripture. I pray everyone here has already trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They realize they can't save themselves, but Jesus Christ saved the chief of sinners so that he could save every other sinner too. And he does it by grace because we don't deserve it, but it's through faith in the blood, in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then, Father, I pray that each person realize we are saved to serve and to glorify you in these bodies that we, that we dwell in today. And, uh, and then that warning that the day is going to declare what sort our work is. So thank you for our gathering and pray it makes a difference in our life for your honor and glory and even for our good. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tom, for another excellent message from God's Word. Let's stand and sing a little chorus, Jesus Paid It All. It's 77 if you don't know it. Jesus Paid It All. You are dismissed.